author. Hello, everybody. I have the pleasure of my wonderful friend, Jennifer, who is studying all of this wonderful material and school, who's going to be joining us and giving us her um, uh, her opinion, her expertise on what she's learning um, as we are reading this chapter. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Say hi, Jen. Hi, how are and you? Tell everybody a little bit about uh, why you're, you're studying this material. Um, actually, I'm in college to get my psych degree. And as an elective, this is one of the classes that I've opted to. Uh, with having a hair business already, I figured this would be a great asset. And it's something that can actually benefit everybody in their everyday lives as well. So excellent. All right. So let's get to it. We're doing chapter two. And the reason why everything is highlighted is because it's as per my counselor for business. So I'm just listening to what I'm told. <laughs> Two, the balance sheet, what a company owns and what it owes. Ever notice something about a balance sheet? It has a date at the top, not a span of time, just one day. It's usually the end of a year or quarter, but it can be the end of a month or any other date. What the balance sheet gives you is a snapshot of certain key facts about a business as of that date. The word snapshot is important because the other financial statements we'll describe are different. They cover a period of time and show how your company did over that period of time. The balance sheet, by contrast, tells you how you ended up or where you are right now. For this reason, the balance sheet is sometimes called the statement of financial position. And what does it show? The balance sheet all by itself tells you some interesting and important facts about your company. Is the business solvent? That is, are its assets at, assets at least equal to its liabilities? If the company were liquidated tomorrow, would the owners have anything to show for their effort? The balance sheet doesn't give you an ironclad answer to this question for reasons we'll discuss below but it gives you a rough indication of where you stand on this score. Is the business sufficiently liquid? That is, does it have enough cash and other liquid assets to cover its short-term ob term obligations? In other words, are you going to be able to pay your bills during the period of time immediately following the date on the balance sheet? What do your company's assets consist of? A balance sheet shows you how much money you have in cash or short-term investments. It shows how much you have tied up in inventory and in plants and equipment. It also shows you how much you're owed by other people. Who has a claim to those assets? A balance sheet doesn't name names, of course, but it does show you how much you owe to various categories of creditors, vendors, lenders, or the government, etc., and how much belongs to the owners of the business. There's a lot more you want to know about a company's financial situation and performance. That's why accountants invented the other statements we'll be discussing and why it's always a good idea to look at balance sheets from at least two, at least two periods so you can see how the numbers you're interested in have changed over time. But for the moment, we'll focus on the terms and format of a single balance sheet. We'll illustrate the lesson as, as we will throughout the book with numbers belonging to a company we'll call Soho Equipment Incorporated. Soho Equipment's name and financial statements are fictitious, but Soho is modeled after a real business, and it's a lot like many, many small companies throughout the United States. Soho In Equipment Incorporated. It's September 1st, and a couple named Bill and Carolyn Michaels are happy indeed. They have just taken what they think of as the second biggest step in their life. Two years earlier, they had gotten married. That was number one on the list. Today, they are owners of their own Kyle, of their own business, sorry. <laughs> I didn't see that last word. Of their own business. Kyle Williams is ha pretty happy too. He's the guy who sold them the business, and he's delighted to be out of under it. The story goes back a few years. That's what, that was when Williams, who had worked in the office equipment industry for most of his career, began noticing a couple of interesting phenomena. One was the growing number of people working at home, soloists, as they were, becoming, they were coming to be known. Of course, many tradespeople and other self-employed folks had always worked out of their homes, 
but the new soloists were a much larger and more diverse group than before. They were sales representatives, computer programs, crammers, and consultants. They were engineers, marketing specialists, and would-be entrepreneurs. Though most of the soloists worked alone, a few had two or three, three associates camped out in a den or spare bedroom. And though most were self-employed, a significant number were telecommuters. Whatever the situations, William noticed, noted, the new soloists all had home offices, and the offices needed a lot of equipment. Each office had to have at least one computer and printer. It had to have telephone equipment, some kind of answering system, and a fax. Many of the offices needed, needed a small copier. The soloists themselves needed laptops and cell phones for the time they spent on the road. In short, the soloists as a group made up a large growing market for office equipment. But Williams knew from experience that these people weren't buying from traditional office equipment companies like those he had worked for. Instead, they bought their equipment from mail order suppliers or from big office discount chains. He also knew from conversations with friends and business acquaintances who were setting up home offices that they weren't happy with their choices. They rarely knew what kind of equipment they needed. They didn't know what brands to buy. Computers, in particular, left most of them perplexed. All that talk in the ads about gigabytes, RAM, and megahertz just didn't make much sense. What's more, the soloists didn't trust the vendors they were dealing with to give them expert, impartial advice. When something went wrong with a piece of equipment, or they, when they found they needed something other than what they had brought, they had no one to call. So Williams quit his job and started a new company, which he dubbed Williams Office Equipment. His business plan was simple. He would focus on people with home offices. He would offer them a limited but varied selection of high quality equipment. He would help them understand exactly what they needed and customize their equipment as necessary. He would even offer turnkey services, going into a customer's home and setting up an office from scratch. If the equipment broke down or needed replacement, he would have service technicians on call. William figured that this, his hometown, a mid-sized Connecticut city, and its entire surrounding area were his marketplace. He cashed in some investments and refinanced his house. He brought inventory, rented a storefront, leased a van, hired a young man who had a way with computers, and took out a big ad in the local paper. He was in business. But for Williams, the business was a disaster. Only a few years, years later, he was ready to get out. He had been right about one thing. The company was a good idea. The market was definitely there. Soloist values the ser valued the services he offered and many became customers. But the headaches. He hadn't realized how demanding customers would be. It seemed that they were always calling with questions or problems and Williams was a hands-on guy who wound up fielding most of the calls himself. He did manage to sell a fair amount of equipment, but his margins were poor. And as a small dealer, he couldn't get great prices from the manufacturers, and he could never charge more, much more than a discount chain in the next town. Over time, he had accumulated a good deal of inventory and had brought three vans and a computer system and had become known in the community. But he was still working 70-hour weeks and barely scraping by. The entrepreneurial life he re finally realized just wasn't for him. When an old friend told him of a, of a regional office equipment distributor that was looking for a vice president, Williams could scarcely get on the phone on, to the phone fast enough. It took him only a week to land the job. It took only another week to put Williams Equipment Inc. up for sale. This was the opportunity Bill and Carolyn Michaels, the buyers and new owners, had been looking for. Both in their late 30s, Bill and Carolyn had met while working in the marketing department of a large company. But they didn't want to stay in their jobs, nor did they want to continue living in the big city where the company was located. Their ideal was to move to a smaller city near their families and to buy a business of their own. When a broker introduced them to Kyle Williams and Williams Equipment, they felt certain that this was the company for them. It was in the right place. It was the right size. Thanks to an inheritance from Carolyn's uncle, they could afford it. Of course, they did their due diligence. Bill inspected the inventory and poured over Kyle Williams' operations. Carolyn scouted out the competition and talked to some of the company's customers. They decided that the company had tremendous prospects for growth. Williams, they felt, had been too caught up in the day-to-day -day detail to see the big picture. Always trying to do things himself, he couldn't offer first-rate service. 
always desperate for cash he required his customers to pay on delivery and if they couldn't he'd show up at their, up at their homes the next day seeking a check he had earned himself some ill will for this practice carolyn learned bill and carolyn had big plans they were both experienced marketers and that and they were certain that they could broaden the company's customer base considerably they were also confident of their ability to attract and manage good people they would advertise next day delivery and world-class service they would train their employees to provide what they were promising they would also give their soloist customers 30 days to pay just like regular businesses like many buyers of small companies bill and carolyn didn't actually purchase the stock of williams equipment incorporated instead they set up a new corporation and acquired williams equipment's assets the transaction is known as an asset sale <clears throat> They even came up with a new name, Soho Equipment, after the acronym for Small Office Home Office, which was then catching on in the industry. One fine summer day, the deal was done and Soho Equipment was in business. The company's balance sheet that day showed what the couple brought and what the new company, their new company now owns. Understanding the Balance Sheets Assets Thanks to accounting standards, every company in America has a balance sheet that follows a similar for format. Soho equipments may be a little simpler than General Electric's, but categories and arrangement are similar. The first thing you'll see on any balance sheet on the left-hand side or on the top, if the balance sheet is laid out vertically, is the heading Assets. Assets can be a difficult category to grasp, thank you, because it includes different kinds of things. The cat, you can leave it up there while well, just so people can see. Okay. The, thank you. The cash a company has in the bank is an asset. So is the computer on the receptionist's desk and the inventory in the warehouse. If customers owe the company's money, the amount they owe is considered an asset. Assets are the things the company has and uses in its business that have value extending into the future. The assets side of the balance sheet shows what a business owns. Traditionally, they are limited and listed in order of liquidity. That is how easy it would be to turn them into cash. So right now, if you're watching this, take a screenshot so Jennifer can put the book down um, and you can have this and you can understand what we're going through. Thanks, Jen. So let's go down or you can pause this video and look at it and take a screenshot. So let's go down the asset categories one by one. First on the list comes cash and cash equivalents. This is real money. It includes what a company has in the bank. It also includes certificates of deposits that mature in less than 90 days and shares in a money market fund. In most companies, cash is a small part of total assets, but it's the only item anywhere on the balance sheet that you can actually spend, or I like to use the word use right now. <laughs> Spend means that it goes away forever. We don't want to do that in a business. We want to recirculate. So we say use. So I will be switching spend for use. Sorry, authors. Everything else on the asset side is either an item of value other than cash, a machine, say, or else an unsettled promise and agreement such as a receivable. Kyle Williams had $25,000 in his company's checking account the day the company changed hands, and the buyers acquired that cash along with everything else. Next on the list of assets comes accounts receivable. This is what people owe the business, that is, what they have promised to pay. Usually, most of the receivables consist of trade receivables or what the company is owed by customers. Businesses Businesses expect to be paid by these customers in 30 days or so, so these receivables are almost like cash. Thanks to Kyle Williams' pay-on-demand policy, the new owners of Soho Equipment have no receivables, though they will have some as soon as they make their first credit sale. Usually, the only companies with zero or near-zero receivables are retailers who don't offer their own charge cards to their company. Then comes inventory. Companies in manufacturing industries have raw materials, work in process, and finished goods inventory. Retailers and wholesalers have goods on the shelves waiting for sale. The inventory is valued according to the various accounting principles relating to its cost. Explaining these principles would take us beyond the scope of this book, but when you hear accountants argue about LIFO versus FIFO, or in the last first 
last in, first out versus first in, first out, what they're discussing is different methods of valuing inventory. So I just want to read what's on the bottom of that um, balance sheet. So we have, you want to put the picture up again real quick? Yep. Um, we have assets, cash and equivalents, accounts receivable, inventory, notes receivable, current assets, gross fixed assets, less accumulated depreciation, net fixed assets, goodwill, net, other investments, total assets. How to read the balance sheet. Balance sheets appear in very, very, a variety of formats. We use a com common one here. Some line items are subtotaled, and the subtotal is indicated by a single line. For example, the first four items in the statement above are subtotaled as current assets. Then the all subtotals plus any items that are not included in a subtotal are added to get to the total at the bottom. To get to $215,000 in total assets, for example, add the $100,000 in current assets the $100,000 in net fixed assets, and the $15,000 in goodwill net. Negative numbers in a balance sheet, numbers that must be subtracted when you're doing the totaling, are customarily indicated by parentheses. If, they, if there were any accumulated depreciation in the statement above, for instance, it would be subtracted from the gross fixed assets to the net fixed assets. So I'd like you to hear, Jen, to like explain a little bit about what you see in this balance sheet. So... Yeah, anytime you have positive numbers like this, so you just add. But yeah, when you actually have, when they talk about negative, like when that'll come into your, um, when you go into your liabilities is where we're going to see more of that. So your assets is just all, all ads. So, and also to goodwill, people think that, Goodwill can be several different things that they'll go into later on, but goodwill is more of like what things that you're donating to your, uh, your products and things to, or your money to that kind of thing. So, so is that um, charity? That's, that was, that was actually the question. <laughs> it, it, it actually is more than charity. So okay. goodwill could also, it, it's. I will pull that up and then we can go over that at another time when we actually get more into this. Yeah. A lot of people are not going to have the goodwill so far okay. as when it comes into the business. So okay, we're and gonna for go myself, like accounts receivable, I don't have accounts receivable because in my shop, I collect everything. So they're correct. Like in small businesses, you're not going to have the accounts receivable. Okay. All right, so I think we left off. Um, where did we leave off? Anything? Or was it, I don't even know. What, I should have put my finger on it. <laughs> where, where did we leave off? I'm. You left off on page fourteen. So. Right all right. So I it was a twelve-month period. I think it was. Right. I am going to have to pause myself for just a, a minute. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. And yeah, then I'll, I'll will... continue come back in okay okay cool first in this category is an item we labeled gross fixed assets many balance sheets label it gross property plants and equipment same thing this shows what a company has tied up in its buildings vehicles machinery and all other tangible items a business buys and then expects to use over a period of time most of the time in this category are very definitely not liquid you wouldn't turn them into cash unless you decided to redeploy your assets, for example, by selling your building and leasing space instead. Bill and Carolyn's new company bought $100,000 worth of gross fixed assets, including Kyle's Williams vans and computer equipment. Note a funny thing about that gross fixed assets number. When accountants write down the value of a company's fixed assets, they use what is called historical cost. In other words, they measure the value of an asset by what the business paid for it, not by what it may be worth now. This has implications that we'll explain in a moment. Next comes an item called accumulated depreciation. Right here, unfortunately, is where some accountants and financial folks begin to confuse their clients. After all, almost everything else on the asset sides of the balance sheet is something you can see, touch, collect, or spend. Accumulated depreciation, by contrast, is just some paper number. How can a business own an accumulated depreciation? The answer is, it doesn't. 
Depreciation is simply a way of spreading the cost of an asset over a certain number of years with the time span roughly corresponding to the useful life of the asset. Accumulated depreciation is just a way of showing how much the cost has been allocated to prior years. An example should clarify this idea. Say you run a flower shop and you brought a delivery truck three years ago for $25,000. The entire $25,000 is included in the gross fixed asset line of your balance sheet because that's what you paid for the truck, its historical cost. But by now the truck is three years old and its value has declined. Each year your accountant has listed a portion of the truck's price as an expense on your income statement and is said to have depreciated it. More on this next chapter. Accumulated depreciation line on the balance sheet shows the total cumulative depreciation over the three years since you brought the truck. So why is Soho's equipment's accumulated depreciation zero? Simple. When business assets are sold to a new owner, their fair value is refigured as of the date of the sale. That becomes the new gross fixed assets figure, and the new owner begins depreciation all over again. When we see Soho's balance sheet at the end of Bill and Carolyn's first year, we'll see some accumulated depreciation. Typically, a balance sheet will sh then show net fixed assets or net property, plant, and equipment, which is the gross number minus accumulated depreciation. The gross shows what the company paid for its fixed assets. The net shows that cost minus accumulate, accumulated depreciation. There may, there may be other items on a balance sheet as well. Other operating assets is a catch-all category that can include items such as a prepaid insurance policy or prepaid rent on a building. If other assets are short-term, they will appear above the gross fixed assets. If they're long-term, they'll appear after net fixed assets. Other investments refer to assets as long-term CDs or equity in another business. And many companies like Soho Equipment have this labeled goodwill. You're likely to run into this, into this puzzling term, goodwill. It's usually written as one word. Anytime a business is sold and understanding it will help you understand its assets, uh, asset sides of the balance sheet. All of the other assets on the balance sheet have a defined value. Cash and accountants receivable have a dollar value. So do fixed assets with a dollar value determined as described earlier in this chapter. But someone who buys a company, even in an asset sale, is usually buying much more than the assets recorded on the seller's balance sheet. <clears throat> the buyer gets an ongoing business. The company has a customer list, business relationship, a reputation, a place in the community. The price of the business will be determined not just by the value of the seller's assets, but by the company's market value, which depends on these intangibles and many other factors that do not appear on the seller's balance sheet. What a buyer pays for a business is often more, sometimes much more, than the dollar value of the assets on the seller's balance sheet. That extra that the buyer pays is what accountants call goodwill. It appears on the balance sheet just like any other asset, and it will be amort, 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 amortized over time, much like any depreciable asset. It's the most common form of what we what are known as intangible assets, something that has value but can't be touched, collected, or spent. In this case, Bill and Carolyn paid $215,000 for the assets of Williams Elect Equipment Incorporated. Since the cash inventory and fixed assets were only worth $200,000, the remaining $15,000 is goodwill. So that's it for assets. The last line in this section of the balance sheet is simply a summation of all the others. Just be sure not to count both gross fixed assets and net fixed assets when you're adding. 
For most small companies, the key items on the balance sheet are cash, accounts receivable, inventory, if the company has any, and net fixed assets. These items will nearly always show the bulk of what a business owns. Understanding the balance sheet, liabilities. Liabilities and equity make up the right-hand side or the lower half of a balance sheet. The liabilities entry shows claims of the company's assets held by people outside of the business. The equity entries show what's left for the company's owners after all of their claims have been accounted for. So this is table 2.2. I'll try to put it close to you guys so you can see it and take a picture. Hopefully you'll see that clearly. So screenshot that so you can see it. What's on the list? Let's see. Um, okay, understanding. Okay. What's on the list of a typical small company's liabilities? Liabilities are categorized by how current they are. Those that must be paid in the next 12 months are at the top, so we'll start there. The first entry is accounts payable, which is zero. This doesn't need much explanation. It's what the company owes, owns its ven owes its vendors and suppliers for goods and services purchase. So ho equipment doesn't have any payables at the time of the sale because outstanding bills are the responsibility of the seller. It will have some, of course, as soon as it begins to buy new inventory. So you see at the top it says accounts the account received the account receivable accounts payable is zero because they already have it. Okay. The next entry is tax payable. Again, no explanation is necessary. What a company owes the government for income tax is just another kind of payable. And if the business has other short term obligations, they'll be listed under other liabilities. This is another catch all category. It might include vacation that employees have earned but haven't yet taken and deposits that the company has received from customers for work to be performed in the future. All of the above liabilities are summed under the heading current liabilities. Then comes long-term debt. If your company has borrowed money from your uncle, the amount it owes will show up here. Bill and Carolyn Michaels negotiated a price with Kyle Williams, but they couldn't come up with the entire amount in cash. So Williams agreed to hold an interest-bearing note for $10,000 while the entire principal due with, with the entire principal due in 24 months. Most balance sheets then add up all these liabilities to show the company's total liabilities. Then comes the entries that show equity. Typically, the equity balance, the equity entries are labeled common stock or paid in capital, which includes all the money that shareholders have invested in the company and retained earnings, which is all the accumulated profits the company has earned that, has, has, that it has never paid out to shareholders. Bill and Carolyn don't have any retained earnings yet, so their equity is wholly on the form of stock. The 205000 represents the cash they themselves invested to buy stock in their new company. So there's the, the chart again. You can see it. Okay. Take that screenshot. Understanding equity and why a balance sheet balances. Why do balance sheets balance? And what do these equity entries mean anyway? After all, equity isn't something the company owes anybody else. So why does it appear on the same side of the balance sheet as the liabilities entries, which shows what the company owes? The answer to these questions are related and less puzzling than they may seem. First, note an, in note an interesting fact about the balance sheet. The left sides, the asset sides, shows the money value of things. So that's right here. So the asset side shows the value of things. Okay. Let me go back. Let's see. It shows cash in the bank, money that's owed, the business, physical objects such as building and equipment, and intangible assets such as goodwill. The right side, the liabilities, and the equity side is a little different. Sure, it's numbers, but those numbers represent people. 
They represent liabilities the company has incurred to the people who are its creditors. They represent the value held by the people who own the business, the equity. Lou Mobley of IBM liked to say that the balance sheet is a snapshot that connects things to people. So equity is pretty simple. It's all the money that the company theoretically owns the owners of the business after reviewing everything it owes all the creditors at all that it owes all the creditors. Let me read that again. So the equity is pretty simple. It's all the money that the company theoretically owes the owners of the business after everything it owes all creditors have been account has been accounted for. Much better. Another way of saying it, assets equal liabilities plus equity. Accountants call this basic accounting equation. So that's why the totals on both sides of a balance sheet are identical. It's why a balance sheet balances. Of course, accountants don't just subtract the liabilities from the asset and assume that whatever they get is the correct number for the owner's equity. They have to add up common stock, paid in capital, and retained earnings, and be sure the total equals assets minus liabilities. This can sometimes be a daunting task, which is why the world needs accountants after all. It's also why equity appears on the liability side of the sheet. If you're a business owner, one thing you want to know from a balance sheet is how much do I, or do we, the shareholders, have left after over after we take into account everything that is owed to other people. Add up the assets, subtract the liabilities, and presto. There's what your ownership and business is worth according to accounting rules. Why did we put in that qualifier according to accounting rules? Well, remember the exclamation above. If you sell your stake in a business, it's going to be worth whatever someone wants to pay for it. What the balance sheet shows is the book value. That is what your assets minus your liabilities are worth according to historical cost, depreciation, and all other rules accounting's use to calculate their value. As for Bill and Carolyn, they've invested $205,000 in a company that also has borrowed $10,000 from Kyle Williams, which right now is its only liability. It has $215,000 worth of assets. Its equity, or what the stockholders invested, which is $205,000, equals its assets, $215,000, minus its liabilities, $10,000. Two quick exercises use, using the balance sheets. Okay, enough on Soho equipment at the moment. Now we'd like you to get out your own company's last balance sheet and check it out. Look for two things. First, is that equity figure a positive number? We hope it is. If it's a negative number, that's a sign your company is in trouble or maybe that it, it is new and struggling. Whatever the reason, right now, you don't have enough assets to cover your liabilities. You'll need a plan to change that situation as soon as possible. Next, get out your calculator. Add the cash and accounts receivable figures on the asset sides and write down the sum. Thank you. Separately, add accounts payable and other current obligations listed on the liability side and write down this sum. Then divide the first number by the second. What do you get? As a rule, the ratio should be greater than one dollar. If it isn't, that means you don't have enough cash or near cash to cover your short-term ob term obligations. Those due in the next 12 months. According to accountants, this is called the quick ratio or acid test. That's the thank you. It's a useful tool for estimating at a glance whether your company is facing immediate li liquidity immediate liquidity problems. Liquidity problems is an account accountant ease for not enough cash. <laughs> However, it's the only first approximation. For one thing, you can have enough cash today and still run out of cash next month. For another, receivables are not always as good as cash. It depends on how old they are and how confident you are in your ability to collect. We'll take up both these problems later in the book. And please, don't get the quick ratio confused with another tool, the current ratio. Your loan officer at the bank probably likes to look at the current ratio because it adds items such as inventory and other current assets into cash and receivables figure and compares that total with short-term obligation. Loan officers figure that in a pinch, they can always convert inventory into cash and get their money back. But to a manager, the current ratio can be misleading. 
If a company carries a lot of inventory, for instance, the current ratio looks better than if it carries only a little, all else, all else being equal. However, carrying a lot of inventory isn't necessarily in a company's best interest. Solvency and liquidity are just two items that financial people look at when they're assu uh, bleh, assessing a company's balance sheet. You've probably heard these folks talk about strong and weak balance sheets. In general, a balance sheet is called strong when a company has a nice financial cushion. Its liabilities are small compared to its equity. A weak balance sheet is just the opposite, high liabilities compared to equity. Of course, this assessment of a balance sheet is never the whole picture of a business. We'll see later on a company can have more assets, even more cash, than it can profitably put to work. A large cash balance makes those current and quick ratios look good. Again, all else being equal. But an astute analyst would want to know why that cash isn't being better re reinvested. By the same token, a company with high liabilities relative to equity may be using borrowed money effectively to generate more profits than it otherwise could. You also have to remember that the balance sheet is a snapshot and no, and, and to a certain extent, the picture it portrays depends on when you snap the shutter. Say for example, your uncle Hen Harry owns a quarter of your company's, company's stock and that you decide to use the company's unneeded cash to buy him out and retire the stock. The day before the transaction, your balance sheet shows all the cash you'll be using to buy his stock. The day after the transaction, the balance sheet shows a lot less cash because it has been paid to Uncle Harry, and a lot less equity because Uncle Harry's outstanding shares of stocks have been reduced to zero, but just as many liabilities. The balance sheet is suddenly weaker because the company has less equity, but no fewer liabilities, even though nothing else has changed in the business. In sum, the balance sheet tells you some important information like what the company owns and what it owes, but it also leaves out a lot. It doesn't tell you whether the company made money last year. It doesn't tell you where the company's cash came from and whether it had a healthy cash flow. That is why people invented other financial statements. We'll examine the two most important in the following chapters. Chapter two end. So what would you like to add from this, Jen? You're muted, honey. Okay. There we go. So on this one right here, so what it talks about a balance sheet, this number up here with your total assets here is going to match your total liabilities down here. So this is where it had this is why they call it a balance sheet. So creating this balance, then you actually see where things had been moved, where mm -hmm. your cash had been to buy out the uncle's stock. So mm -hmm. you will take out negative cash on your assets and then put it over here on your, what would be your, um, your common stock mm -hmm. and put it there because you bought your, bought the stock there. So you're, you're moving stuff around, but everything balances your total assets and your total liabilities will balance, have the same number. So at the end of each month or quarter or year, and if you don't, those don't balance out balance sheet, then you have to go back and find where the missing money was or where things got moved around. And that's where the day-to-day -day accounting comes in, like what you were talking about with QuickBooks, things like that to set up. Then you have your day to day there that makes this balance sheet flow much better. Yep. Also, an another thing that we'll actually go into that a lot of people miss is intangible assets. When we actually do a trademark, we do uh, your uh, any type of branding that we're paying for. That is an intangible asset that is an asset. So that needs to be included in there. So that is something that you own, the company is paid for, but that's one thing that I wasn't aware of until I actually took this, was started taking this class and intangible assets are included on the balance sheet. So mm -hmm. they are important. And I think a lot of people miss that too. So it's figuring out as we go through, like it's, there's a details to this, that some things um, that will go over through the process that I was unaware of, like. I thought I understood, but then breaking it down onto the balance sheet made things a lot different. So 
It does. It does. But this is, this is really great to be able to go over this and talk about these different things. And maybe we can, you know, we'll, we're going to definitely discuss offline a little bit about our own businesses and how, how we can make sure that our balance sheets are exactly on the money. Our snapshot is yes, really definitely. good. All right. Thank you so much, Jen. I am going to pause it here. Just cool. hang on.